Tech Tuesday webinars are brought to you by Nonprofit Webinars, which in addition to this Tech Tuesday series offers a Wednesday webinar series and provides fully customized webinar production and hosting services for other organizations, and by CJW Consulting and Services Incorporated, providing software and technology related training, consulting, and services to nonprofit organizations. And next slide, please. Nonprofit Webinars is a service of Good Done Great, which also produces Mission.do, the first and only web-based platform as a service for nonprofits. With Mission.do, you and your staff can build apps in an easy drag-and-drop environment that will work exactly the way you work and not the way pre-built software tells you to work. It's easy, fast, and affordable, starting at $100 per month for free users. Open another browser tab now and go to Mission.do so that you don't forget to check it out after the webinar. Now, if we can go to the next slide, I will introduce our presenters. Racino's Marketing Connections provides direct and social media marketing services for nonprofits and direct marketing agencies. They have been certified mailing experts since 1992 and over the past 19 years have become the one-stop shop for all things marketing. As thought leaders of a business that specializes in personalized communications, they believe in maintaining personal relationships with their customers and working together to solve direct marketing challenges. So take it away, Sue and Ron. Well, hi, everybody out there. My name is Ron Racino, and along with my partner, Sue Racino, we are very glad you're able to join us today for this webinar that we've entitled Jumpstarting your direct mail program, direct mail and annual fund program, and as Sherry said, doing it now. Racino's Marketing has been in business for over 20 years, and we want you to know that our expertise is in the nonprofit arena. Over 90% of the companies that we work with are just like you, that is, nonprofit charitable institutions. Um, we're using the terms direct mail and annual fund here kind of interchangeable, direct mail being the general term, and more specifically, annual fund. And hopefully what we're going to be able to, to do today is give you some actionable items that you can immediately implement into your direct mail program, not only for the annual fund, but uh, throughout your direct mail program, that you, you don't have to wait for whatever. There are common sense things that you can do to beginning today to help energize and invigorate your program. So that having been said, I want to introduce to you my partner, Sue Racino, who will start the presentation. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for attending today. Um, what we would like to do is uh, first take a look at the industry today. Then we're going to talk about basics of an annual appeal. And then probably the most important thing is to how to improve on your existing um, annual fund program. So I think the main thing that's happening out there today is um, what's happening with the role of direct mail and um, how it's changed, especially in the past three years because of um, social media. And I think all of our constituents are being um, bombarded with um, endless amounts of marketing messages. And the trick is to be able to figure out how to connect to your donors um, the proper way, the, through the right um, channel. And so these are just some interesting facts um, that we wanted to bring up to you today. And I know you're going to get this. I know it looks like this big, scary, um, it has a lot of text on here. But really, there's just a couple things that we want to focus on. Um, that you, first of all and foremost, you have to be aware that um, it has changed out there. And because of all the changes with social media, you need to really figure out how you need to connect with your uh, donors. And um, your concerns as marketers has changed because your focus should be more on your return for your investment and the efficiency of how you're spending the money of your organization. Um, the one thing I want to bring up is um, the interesting uh, chart we have over on the right-hand side when you look at direct mail, it's still the number one um, channel. On um, it, it, This is in terms of purchasing and also for donor relations. So it, uh, just a couple of things I'd like to bring up here. When Sue mentions uh, 
donor expectations and, and, and what donors, uh, how donors are different today. And I, I'm sure if you've been in this business for any amount of time, you know that what donors expect from their charitable organization today is much different than it was even five years ago. Um, donors want more meaningful information. They want deeper relationships and more quote-unquote say in how their donations are, are used. They believe it's your job as the advancement or development director to understand them and connect on their terms. And that certainly is a challenge. You know, according to a, a socialbright.org, the big six most important nonprofit communication channels are, and I would challenge you to ask yourself, how many of these channels do you currently use? The website, email, Facebook, direct mail, in-person events, and media relations. And the more of those that you use, the better the chance that you are going to connect with your constituents. Okay, let's move on then. Um, we're, we want to look at um, how um, different things that you do with your donors can improve your response rate. So um, things that you need to be considering are improving segmentation. Um, you need to also um, deliver what we were saying before, the right uh, personalized message um, the right way and engage the customer um, or donor. And we also, the most important thing here is you need to analyze what you're sending out. Um, we need to make sure, and we're going to talk more about these as we go through. You know, when, uh, when Sue and I go out and talk with the uh, clients or prospects for that matter, one of the questions that we like to ask is, why do your donors give? And oftentimes we are met with a more or less blank stare or, or a kind of a general answer that, well, they give for a variety of reasons. And that is what, what I call the secret. Once you know the answer to the secret or why your donor gives, you will know what segment the donor belongs in. And it makes it much easier than to communicate with them. Did they give because of a personal connection or to get you to stop bothering them maybe? Hopefully that's not the reason. Or did they give for recognition, for a tax benefit? <clears throat> or maybe they're, they're getting something back from the organization. So finding out the answer to that secret, that is why donors give, it, to us is key to, to improving um, the communication cycle. Okay. All right. So is this you? I hope not. Um, what we find with our clients is that they are just overwhelmed by the always changing market. Everybody's always talking about they're not sure whether they should be doing Facebook or email or direct mail. Um, they're struggling with response rates or they're not even um, finding out about what the response rates are. And um, they want to, they know that they want to improve the program, they just don't know how to do it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so these are just a few steps to help you um, jumpstart your uh, current program. We want to start with the basics. Um, our annual appeals should consist of at least three mailings per year. Okay, this is what we preach to everybody. Um, we should, you should be personalizing your letters, you should always include a reply device, and you should be asking for a specific gift. Now, there may be many of you out there who are doing way more of that, but without knowing the audience, we want to at least cover these are the basics. The other thing that I want to say is that um, for each of these things that you do, like with personalizing your letter, you're going to get a list in your response rates if you do that, if you put, include the reply device, if you ask for a specific gift, you will get um, a better response rate. And, and we'll talk more about that response rate issue and that the, the issue of list or, or increase as we go along with this. But um, we are sometimes surprised that at some of the places that we want to talk with and um, these basics are not being done. Um, and, and we really believe that you, you, if you're not, you're missing out on great opportunities to increase for increased giving. 
Yeah, one of the things we hear about when people ask us about annual appeals it, um, is they think that an annual appeal is one mailing a year. Um, and it is not. It should consist of um, at least two others. So there should be a total of three. Um, yeah, and that, that's one of the questions that we get asked a lot. So Sue, maybe now would be a good time to ask if there are any questions. So far, Jamie, do we have any questions yet? We do have one or two here. Yeah, I think we have one from, um, hold on just a second. Uh, from Alan, um, why ask three times a year? Many organizations ask uh, around holiday time and it's springtime twice a year. Right. And uh, well, the thing is, the the more mailings you send out, the more don donations you're going to receive. So I'm not saying that you have to ask, um, continue to ask the same people. Um, once once they've given. Uh, normally, what, what it used to be was always very interesting. It used to be that once they gave, you didn't bother asking them, or you didn't bother them for another year. Now we're seeing that people are sending out in the fall um, to everyone. They send out at the holidays to everyone, and then they send out in the spring just to those who have not responded to the first two. And that sort of begs the question, Alan, of, um, you know, what if a person has said to you or expressed in a survey, for example, that they only want to be communicated with uh, via uh, one vehicle one time a year? Well, certainly, if that's the case, you, you put that down into, into that person's uh, individual data, and that's how you communicate with them. We're talking, of course, here in general, that the general rule is three times a year. Right. OK. okay. Um, Sarah has a question also. Is three mailings optimal, and is more more than three overkill? Um, I do not believe it's overkill. Um, there are many organizations that do more than three. I think that when you're, um, right now, I'm talking about solicitation letters. But there should be other things like newsletters and invitations to events. You still want to be touching them in other ways that can be done through direct mail, email, Facebook, all different kinds of channels. You can be contacting them. But um, it, it, it is not like I have organizations that I work with that with their donors, they actually contact more than three times. Okay, and Richard is asking, what are the recommended times of the year for those three mailings? I know you. And you know what? We're bit. actually going to cover that. So, um, and I believe that's the next slide. Okay, and that's interesting, Richard, that you asked that because, um, as they say, timing is everything. And um, what we have here is what we have always seen for the past thirty years is it's been September, December, and March. That's when people have normally sent out their appeals. What we are seeing, the, the change seems to be going um, to mail sooner, so August, November, February. Um, what I'm really seeing a lot is the holiday appeal. People are getting tired of landing in the mailbox with 10 other solicitations, so they're moving them up. And they're not just moving them up until Thanksgiving. Um, you know, everybody wants it to drop the uh, day before Thanksgiving so that people get it the day after Thanksgiving. But that's when the mailbox is the most crowded. So we've got people that are moving that up to the beginning of November. Also, you have to know your constituencies. When they are responding, like Ron said before, and you can be tracking that, too, and sending them to, you know, um, to remind them when they normally respond. Okay. Um, okay, we do still have a couple of other questions. Oh, okay, well, let's go. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Doug is wanting to know, how would you ask for a specific gift when mailing to large quantities of people? Okay, and we are going to discuss that in um, regards to personalization. We have a whole section on that. Okay. okay. Is there any more questions? So just hold on, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pavla is asking whether you can suggest some ways how to find potential donors. 
she is very new um, to, I think, to nonprofit. They have no donors, and she's still in a stage of developing the audience for her charity. Okay. Okay, well, that, that's a very interesting question because a lot of people are looking to acquire new donors. And I'm happy to say that um, we are, um, we have recently, probably in the past year, have been going back to purchasing lists. You can uh, purchase lists of donors um, that are interested in certain things, um, known, there, you can give zip codes if, if it's a national organization, if it's a neighborhood uh, organization, you can get the names um, and addresses of donors in your area um, and it's not that costly you'd be very surprised you could purchase a list of probably about um, 5,000 for um, about le like less than a thousand dollars like maybe eight hundred dollars so uh, and people are doing that more and more and getting decent response rates with those and depending on of course what your organization what it is and, and who it serves. You can get uh, information on uh, ethnicity, on uh, um, socioeconomic information. You would be surprised at how, at how specific you can get on your list to really target uh, an acquisition mailing today. Right. Okay, we have a question from Jane. Um, she's indicating that her board is concerned that asking three times a year to their general membership will result in donor fatigue and wonders if you have any suggestions for her. I think it, I think you need to educate your board on, um, and, I, and you can easily get statistics online that um, prove that uh, three times a year is going to get you a better response rate. And I think if you start to do analysis, then you can show them what each mailing will bring in. And um, if they, it, the donor fatigue starts if you keep asking the same ones. Um, we're not suggesting that you do that three times. We're suggesting that you, um, uh, with the donors, once you receive a gift, you don't have to mail to everybody at the holidays, and you, and you don't have to mail to everybody in the spring. You can just mail to those who have not responded yet. I hope that answers your question. Okay. okay. One, just one more at this point. Charles is curious about where one can buy mailing lists. Um, you know what? Um, if, if, you can contact us and yeah. I can give you that information, but if there are organizations like ours, um, marketing companies that can get the list for you. Okay. So just work at what you need to be concerned about on your end if you were to call us or any other marketing service provider for that matter is what what your parameters are. What who is it that you you want to go after? And uh, if you can provide that, then uh, places like ours can can get you all kinds of lists. Right. Okay, sure. Yep, we're out of questions for now. Carry on. Okay, um, things to consider when um, planning your annual appeal. Um, you should look at what has been successful in previous direct mail campaigns. Um, what, what, of course, what has worked, what hasn't. Um, what type of messaging they were using. What were they talking about? Um, I th we always need to consider we need the right message, the audience, the frequency, and the channel. Um, you know, everybody talks about this in terms of um, we know that direct mail will get you your best response rate for fundraising, but that doesn't mean it can't be followed up with an email or um, even, um, you know, there could be uh, the Facebook campaigns and things like that. So when we talk about the right channel, that's what we're referring to. Um, did you ask for a specific gift? There are, there are statistics that will show you that if you ask for a specific gift, you will get increased gift amounts. And your budget limit. Don't let it scare you that um, I work for nonprofits for years, and I realize it's every, every year it's they want you to raise more money, and they don't have any more money to give you. And um, you can develop marketing um, development programs 
um, annual fund programs within your budget. We, we work with all different kinds of budgets. And when you have it all planned out from the very beginning, it's very easy to work within your limits. Okay. Um, I mentioned this before. The traditional, um, uh, the traditional letter format um, really does get you your best response rate when you're asking for a donation. We get asked this a lot because um, a lot of people have, um, they think it might be less expensive to go to a self-mailer or um, make the piece smaller or, you know, sometimes there's things you want to get noticed, but um, our whole um, point in bringing this up is that the traditional letter format um, gets you the best response rate. You have to include a reply device. Um, Personalization has a, a little bit extra cost, but it does have its rewards, and you should always include a PS. So, so if, if I were a new um, development officer right now attending this webinar, when, it's, when it were, was over with, I would go back and take this particular slide and see if this is what is being done at your place or not. Um, are you included? including a reply device? Are you making the reply device easy for the prospect or donor to, to, uh, to respond to? Is there a PS? We stress a PS in the letter oftentimes that the PS should be a repeat of what you are asking the, the individual to give. Why? Because People oftentimes scan letters. So read the first paragraph, sort of give a cursory read to the rest of it, uh, and then quickly read the PS. So it's a reminder at the bottom of what has been asked for earlier on in, in the letter itself. Right, and the one thing I don't have on this slide but I want to stress is that you should be saying in the first paragraph what it's all about. Because you'll be lucky if they read the rest of the letter. So you do want to have um, you, you want to have mention of the fact that you're, you know, writing um, because of the annual fund or, or you want to say, you don't have to ask for the, a specific amount in the first paragraph, but you do want to tell them that that's what you're writing about. And, and we'll get more into what a letter should consist of in right. 2012 as, right. as we go forward. Yeah, right here with our next slide, Ron, um, we are going to talk about Okay, I'm not sure what happened here. I'm not moving. There we go. There we go. Um, let's talk about what should be in the letter. Um, we find this um, to be one of the biggest struggles for a lot of clients. Um, we, it needs to be compelling. It needs to be a story. It should not be about the organization and the statistics and facts and, I mean, unless it's, you know, you're writing about a capital campaign and brick and mortar, don't be talking about that stuff. We, the donors want to know why, why their dollar is going to make a difference. The, the way I, I say it is put the donor in the story. You've got to make the story that you tell relevant to the donor. Um, personal stories, it, you know, oftentimes you, you'll pick out a story about a person and that's great at explaining or, or educating, but that does not mean that those kinds of stories compel the reader to act or to donate. For your readers to act, for them to donate, which is what you want them to do, you have to make them see themselves as an essential part of the story, as if something cannot or will not happen unless they act or give. So examples of that. How do you make them feel like an essential part of the story? And when you think back to me talking about discovering the secret as to why donors give, well, it could have been to feel happy. For example, uh, here's a line from uh, a letter. By funding our work, and I'm just generalizing, 
And by funding our work, you'll know you change the life. Or to feel important, give today and become a member and get insider information and updates. Or to feel like part of a success story. And Sue laughs at this example, but I think it's a good one. Uh, a success story for a, for a national um, organization. We saved the Savannah elephant. With your help, we can save the Asian elephant, too. And because everyone's doing it, from Aunt Martha in Louisiana to a construction worker in Seattle, Washington, for example, if it's a national organization, Americans everywhere, or if we're talking about in one city, Chicagoans are already lining up with their commitment in our fight. So it's put in, in that's the sense that I mean where you put the donor, make the donor see himself as integral to your cause. Okay, great, great. Let's move on here. Okay. Know your audiences, and yes, we do mean plural. Um, you need to divide your various audiences into different categories. So, of course, we're going to look at them in terms of donors and non-donors. But then we need to be looking at our donors and find out what they are interested in giving to, what their interests are. Um, for example, here. Um, our son graduated from a high school um, in Chicago. Now, he is um, studying to be an actor. If his high school writes to me about the theater program, which they are fully aware that we are big into the theater program because of our son, they are going to get a better response from me because they know that I'm interested in theater, and when they write to me, that's what they write about. Or the same thing with the hospitals or any of your organizations, if you know what your um, donors like to donate to, then you write to them specifically about those programs and give them updates on those programs. So the, those program-specific donors and those messages that you send to them, that is a great vehicle for increasing gifts. Don't talk to somebody who's interested in the science program at a university about what's happening in the music program and vice versa. Talk to them about what they have demonstrated an interest in in the past. Um, I, I can't stress how important that is. Exactly. Okay, now we're going to go to the next slide here. Um, how to make your direct mail campaign successful. And a lot of this is what we've already talked about in terms of um, you need to do your research. And you need to figure out what your donors donate to, OK? What do they need to know about your organization and to make them donate? Um, and what, what do you already have? What information do you already have about your donors? And it may be that you only have this type of information on a very small amount of your donors. And I mean, maybe if you have 1,000 donors, that there's only, you know, maybe there's a hundred that you have this type of information that somebody likes to give to the scholarship program, somebody likes to give to um, the cancer center, whatever it is. But that's what we're talking about when you target. If you target those people in your annual fund and speak to them specifically about what they're interested in, that will increase your response rate. You may be mailing to a smaller amount, but that's okay because your your um, response rates will increase. So, so just to kind of reiterate that, and, and again, this is essential direct mail, but it, it's it's um, so important. Donors don't give to you or your organization anywhere near as much as they do to your cause. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did not say. I have an organization. He said, I have a dream, right? That's what people give to, the dream. They give to what their gift will mean to the future of your organization, to the future of the world, that, that part of the world that they live in, um, both in the present and for the future. OK. I'm going to move on here. The benefits of personalization, it provides relevant to your donors. 
it, it, it gives me something to open and read that truly matters to me. Um, you can focus your message through segmentation, just like through the many factors we've been talking about, age, gender, um, all, any information you have on their background, um, donor timing, um, like we mentioned before, if you know that certain people always donate at a certain time of year, that's when you should be contacting them. Um, you and, and does that mean that you, you may have to segment out 20 people or 37 people who get a letter at a specific time because you know that's because they've told you so, either through the giving or through uh, a survey, that that's when they want to receive the letter, then yes, it does mean that you have to take that time to do a special mailing to them. And maybe it has to be part of a first class mailing, but uh, certainly the return on your investment there would be well worth it. Right. Okay, now we're going to talk um, more specifically about personalization. Um, and uh, what we have here are a couple different slides that will show you. I think the basic um, personalization, like personalization 101 as we're calling it, is just the salutation. And it, um, when you can personalize the salutation, that's really basic, okay? And if you have the salutation, I'm sure that you have the um, inside address too. All right, if we go to the next slide here, you can also add personalized graphics and images if you see here, um, you see the bubble and um, it says my name, it says Susan, did you know? And it speaks to me. It's another way to personalize something. They've also personalized the graphics and the images up on the top. Um, that is, um, will, uh, of course, increase your response rate. Um, this slide will show you um, different ways that they personalize the text. Um, I am a graduate of St. Xavier University here in Chicago, so it says as a graduate, okay? Um, Susan, as a past donor to St. Xavier, they, they again, have, they have just recognized the fact that I've donated in the past, okay? And um, it says on the reverse side, you'll find a portion of our current honor roll of donors. So why a portion? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure that many of you heard of proof mailing. These mailings are done before the annual report has been completed. A proof mailing is basically um, on a less expensive piece of paper, and it's a list of all of the people who have donated. They do that um, to encourage people to donate more and um, to also encourage people who have not donate, donated to make a gift. Now, those mailings are fairly expensive because they have a list of everybody who's made a donation. Here, what St. Xavier did was on the back of this um, letter to me, instead of putting the entire list of donors, they put all the classes that graduated in, like, in and around my year of graduation. So this would have been all the 80s. Anybody who, uh, and it was all the list, because that's the only people I would know. I wouldn't know the people from the 60s, 70s, 90s. They took all of the 80s, and they put that on the back for me. So they made this a one-page mailing. And they made it a much more uh, customized piece. Exactly. Um, we're showing a sample here of how to personalize your response device. Okay, this is really important, and it's so helpful when it comes back to your data department that the name and address of um, the donors are on there already, so it makes it nice and easy. Um, and it's a very simple process. Um, here, it, uh, they refer to the last gift amount, the $50. It says right up there, uh, by renewing your support of $50 again this year. So that's, that's a very light and easy way to uh, put the suggested gift amount. And let me say, too, you can see on this slide where it also says, please accept my gift of 50 75 or 100 That would change. If I was a $100 donor, that would start at $100, $150, $200. Okay? 
Um, maybe, is there, is, is there any questions that we could answer? Uh, we do have a couple. Mike is, um, wants to know what you think about mailing to fewer potential donors where you might be able to do phone follow-up. I think that's a very good idea. And I think that's what we're talking about in terms of targeting your mail. Um, there's nothing wrong with narrowing the focus. And um, as long as you have a plan to follow up with them. And as well, the other thing that's important is that you always want to make sure that you're still communicating with those non-donors um, via a newsletter or by email or something, because you don't want to lose those people. But in terms of um, narrowing the focus, that's a fine idea. OK. And Charles says, direct, traditional direct mail programs have used letters of four to six pages. Are long letters really better? I, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen a four or six page solicitation letter. Um, no, I, I, I think um, that's um, a prescription for disaster, personally. Uh, and again, in this um, high-speed world that we live in, people come home, they get their mail, they stand over a uh, their garbage can, and they sort their mail. Um, and you know, let's say that you do get them to open it because it's from the university that they graduated from, or the high school, or the hospital that took care of them, or a loved one, for example. If they open it up and they see four or six pages of text, I say you have just um, greatly decreased the chances that that individual is going to read the letter. It needs to be one. We say one page is is really the norm. Yes, that's what we see all the time. That doesn't mean I mean that you don't include a brochure once right. in a while or something like that explaining program. Um, but no, one page is definitely what we see the most of. Okay, anything else, Sherry? Yeah, Elizanne, and I have to say I love that name, um, said that she was looking into the United States Postal Service Every Door Direct Mailing Service, and right. that this does not carry the individual recipient's name. Is this yeah. a good way to go if she wants to reach more individuals? Okay, well, here's the, um, you certainly could do that. And, um, but the, the problem is with that is that the numbers are so large that we find that um, most of our clients would prefer to purchase a list and be more targeted because they'll get a better response. The, the problem with the Every Door Direct Mail is you have no idea who's in that household. So you, if you're looking for a household with children or um, grandparents or veterans or whatever your organization is, um, I'd say you're better off purchasing a list than using Every Door Direct Mail. Every Door Direct Mail is more for um, not nonprofits but retail stores that are going to really um, uh, be there for everyone. Like somebody, you know, window cleaning and, and new windows and things like that. Okay? Okay. Any more questions? Um, do any of these tactics drive to a website to donate online, or is it all via US mail? And that's Doug is asking that. That's a great question. And we are trying extremely hard to have all of our clients add um, to go to the website to um, donate online. That's perfect. That's what you should be doing. Everything should be driving the client, um, I, I mean, sorry, the donors to your website. Um, we also use QR codes, which I'm going to talk about, um, that can bring them right to the website, too. And I, I was going to kind of close with this at the end of the presentation, but since it's come up, uh, I just read about this the other day. A study that was conducted for a nonprofit advising firm found that 17% of donors who gave on a charity website in 2011 said that a direct mail letter prompted their online gift versus 5% who said they gave online because of an email. So, so yes, definitely you want to be um, you, 
the website is, an, is a very important part of that. And uh, so we're, we're often asked about that email part of things. And yes, it's important. It's important for first gifts, perhaps. But then that long-term engagement, uh, it's through direct mail and uh, always driving to the website for online giving. That's perfect. That's all part of it. And then, too, the other nice part about that is if you always find somebody who's um, uh, going online to make their donation, you might want to communicate with them and see if that's how they would prefer to be communicated with. So then you don't have to send them the direct mail piece. Um, that's always interesting to find out. Um, okay, our next slide here is uh, benefits of targeted direct mail. Um, hold, on. This hold on, hold on, hold sure. on. Sorry, <laughs> got a couple okay. of additional questions, and I've actually sort of been waiting for this question to come up. So thank you, Michelle. Uh, she said, and I, I kind of know what you're going to say, I think, but she said what? No ask for an increase? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely you're asking for an increase. You probably saw the one, the one letter where it said, um, thank you for your gift last year, 50, would you consider that gift again? Oh, yeah. Yes. No, we always, we have charged to actually, um, to give to our uh, clients if they don't have them, but you always ask for an increase in a gift, and you'll see the difference when uh, you get your responses. Okay, and Lucy says, what, or asks, what is the best way to uncover a donor's greatest interest? By talking to them, yeah, absolutely. The other, if we're, t if they're donors who are donating, it depends on your organization. I mean, you know, you may have many donors that are five hundred dollars and more. Um, I mean, you might have to start with a small group, but it's by conversation. It's also about testing. You might want to test your direct mail if you, if um, you know, you do a piece on scholarships and then you do a piece on, um, you know, the science program or something, then you'll, if somebody responds to one and not the other, you're going to know what they're interested in giving to. You can also put this, those on the reply devices if they're interested in giving uh, for um, unrestricted funds or if they have specific uh, wants or, um, for their donation. And if I, if you don't mind my sticking my two cents in here, um, oh. mining your data is also a good source of that. If you have people that are kind of long-term donors and yeah. you look back over at what they have given to over the years, you're going to see some very clear patterns emerging in terms of, you know, especially if you're able to track what you sent them as, yeah. you know, and what they've responded to. That will that will you know as as they sort of move along, you'll be able to identify those trends and be able to kind of focus them in on those things to uh, to increase their giving. Absolutely. Okay, Holly has a question. Uh, would you suggest enclosing a survey with your first appeal to uncover donor interests and useful data? That's a wonderful idea. That is a wonderful idea. But then you have to use that information that you gather from the survey. And you have to put it in your data so you can use it. And and if I, I've seen a failing, it, that's it. People ask, um, organizations ask the, the questions, and maybe good questions, but they don't they don't use the information that they learn, and and what a waste. Use that information to communicate to to continue the conversation, as we say, and that's what it's all about. Is in one way or another, through one vehicle or another, continuing the conversation with the donor and or prospect. And if, and again, I apologize for horning in here. I know it's not my not my thing. But no, please. <laughs> but, um, I appreciate it. Yeah, if if you are going to do a survey, you really want to do it. I think sort of in conjunction with what you know your database can track for you, because there's really no point in asking people questions about preferences if there's no place in your database for you to record that. That's so, a very good point. Absolutely. Yeah. So even if you don't get as much information as you would like, again, you can collect all this information, but if you can't record it and you can't you can't get it back out again to do an effective segmentation, then it's not really going to help you a ton. Agreed. Okay. Do we have any more questions? 
I don't think so, but let me just double check real quick. Okay, so I'm not being real quick, but I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we have no more questions, so please carry okay. on. I want to keep going then so we stay with our timeline. Um, the, our next slide here is about the benefits of targeted direct mail. And basically what this shows you is that um, the more targeted we are with our direct mail, the better uh, response that you're going to get. And what we have experienced is we've been preaching this for um, three years now about using variable data and speaking specifically to the donor. And we have seen response rates go from 3% to like 17%. Um, so the, at this slide, you can look at it, but basically that, that's what it's saying, that every time you, you hit it right and you get the right message at the right time, you're going to be increasing your response rate. And, and that, um, that previous slide with, where it said learning, if you were wondering what the learning meant, it's applying the results of what you, in fact, learn in future mailings. Right. That, that's what that was about. Okay. And now we're going to talk about everybody says, well, I'd like to do this, and I agree with you that targeted mail is definitely, you know, the thing to do, but is it worth its cost? And um, on a piece per basis, the cost of a one-to-one -one printing is higher than for static direct mail. Static direct mail is just, um, it's a generic piece. Everything's the same. Um, but on a program cost basis, uh, the cost can very well be lower because um, we often find that we're mailing to fewer pieces and um, therefore your um, cost goes down. So basically, you know, what, what we're trying to do here is when, and it, again, like what Siri was saying, it's, it's in your data. And um, if you have the information in your data and you pull from that, um, you might not have all of the information to do a targeted direct mail piece um, using variable data to your whole constituency. But with your donors, um, maybe you do. So you spend a little bit more money on them. But I guarantee you're going to get better response rates. So, so it, it, to put it in a, in a number kind of, kind of way, if you spend, let's say, $15,000 on a direct mail appeal, and it makes $60,000 for you, is it worth it? Conversely, if you spend $5,000 over the course of a whole year on an email campaign, a lot of people say, oh, we're only soliciting email. If you spend $5,000 over a whole year and you gain few, if any, leads, or the campaign maybe just simply pays for itself, which is really more expensive? The, the five thousand or or the fifteen thousand where you quadrupled your money. Exactly. So you have to consider that as well. And Ron, I actually have a slide here to show. This is great. This is actually um, a client of ours in um, the Chicago land area. We went into their office and they were mailing sixteen thousand every year in their annual appeal. So to everybody. To everyone, and it's a it's a high school, so it was all the graduates. And um, they had, they were not really tracking, like they knew how much money they raised last year, but um, they really weren't sure how much came from direct mail. They kind of had an idea, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, our first question was, why are you mailing 16,000 when you only have 2,000 donors? So what we did was we went through their data, and we found those who've donated in the, in the past five years. We only came up with 2,200. So you can see here that they mailed out 2,200. They received 404 back. The cost per piece was a dollar 70. I guess we'll say 77, right? Their response rate was 17.9 percent. So that that was an 18 percent response rate. They raised 168 thousand dollars. So they they were so thrilled because um, that was more than they had ever raised, even when they had mailed to the 16,000. So um, I give you this to show you that this is, in fact, worth it um, 
to I have to watch time here, so I'm going to keep on going. Okay. Um, but look, I hope they all saw, saw that return on their investment. Oh. Um, over four thousand percent. Right. Right. So um, I want to talk about direct mailing analysis because this is something that you should all be keeping track of, so you can get this kind of statistic, these statistics. Um, you should code your mailing so you know. Um, what you know what the people are responding to and they can be simple codes like you know fall 12 or spring 13 or whatever you want to do but they can be very simple and whenever those are printed up they can be printed right on there um, you should of course know the date of the mailing um, the quantity that was mailed um, cost of the mailing per piece plus your postage don't forget design or anything else that goes along with that um, you want to know um, how many gifts were received and what were the dollars donated. You can then figure out cost per donor, cost per dollar raised, and your return on investment. Um, I, we actually have Excel spreadsheets that we use for all the mailings that we do, that after we do the mailings, we go back and meet with our clients two to three months afterwards. We fill in everything that we need to fill in, and then they fill in theirs, and then we discuss it. Because it's really important to know um, what worked and what hasn't worked, and um, you don't want to be throwing your money out the door. So um, you should always analyze your mailing. Um, this is just an interesting fact to, to show you that um, different campaign types see different increases in response rates, and you can see that the fundraising has the highest increase to targeted direct mail. And um, I just think that's fascinating because um, fundraisers have been doing targeted direct mail for years, um, and they're just doing a better job of it now. Okay, and uh, we just want to make sure that everybody evaluates and they tweak their program and they mail again because we think that that's what's the most important thing, that you, you figure out um, what is working, like we said, you, you tweak it as much as you can, and you have to continue to get the mail out there. We did say we want to talk quickly about um, QR codes. QR codes, um, I think everybody knows what they are. I have a sample of um, one of our business cards here with the QR code on it. Um, it says on there on the right-hand side, scan for mobile business cards. So if I give my business card to somebody, which on the other side of this has my name and all my information, but they can scan it on their smartphone, they can email it to themselves, they can save it to their phone for all my contact information. Um, there are ways to use a QR codes for, um, uh, in development and in the annual fund for um, invitations. We put QR codes on, this was for Children's Memorial Hospital, now Lurie Children's Hospital. They had their walk and run and we had a QR code for them that actually showed them um, when it, on their mobile phone they could actually sign up to walk or run. They could donate now or they could get more information. Um, we also use the QR codes on uh, reply devices. If people would, instead of um, sending in through the mail their reply device form, they can scan it and go right on to the online giving. And for you to develop an office, what does a QR code do for, for you specifically? It makes it as easy as possible for people to give by adding a QR code that drives donors and prospects to a contribution page. Please don't use a QR code to drive people to your website because once they get there, there's inertia. You want action. That's the purpose of a QR code. You can build your marketing database by including QR codes on printed material that enables people to easily sign up for emails and other alerts that your organization has for events and different things like that. Right. I just want to quickly say, if you can send them to a mobile website, but not your general right. website. Right. right. And they can be created, mobile websites and QR codes for like, uh, we do it for less than $300. So that's, I, people sometimes think they cost sure. too much. Um, okay, and then um, did you know the best time to ask for another gift is three to six weeks after a donor has given? Um, I know that is a kind of a new train of thought, but um, this is what 
is happening nowadays. It seems that people, because of the economy, people with money are trying to make up for their neighbors who cannot afford it. So they are giving again and giving more. So that's just an interesting statistic. Um, and then I am hope we uh, we have enough time. I think for a few more questions. But um, yes, are there any sure questions? Oh yes, there are. <laughs> Pabla um, is is back with another question. She wants to know whether she can ask potential donors to donate with the first contact, or should she focus on building a relationship first, and then when they know more about the organization's work, that you know maybe that's a better time to ask for money. And you know, if so, how do you just approach them out of the blue if you're not asking for money, and how do you start a relationship? You know, I, I, I think that's, that's an excellent question. And if, in fact, you have the resources to do a true direct mail program where you're going to be, where you've um, kind of planned out a three-step or whatever step process, um, it, it's probably a very good idea to do a cultivation piece first where you explain and try to explain and educate. And then um, as, you, as you do that, then the, the next communication can be where you're asking for you know, a, a general donation of whatever you decide is correct, $25, uh, $50, a, a minimal donation to begin with. Um, but I think it's, it's an excellent point to, to start with a cultivation piece. Great. Um, Holly asks if you can speak to the benefit of sending direct mail to a name versus sending to dear friend because um, she's concerned that it's very difficult to get it right and they're trying to kind of decide which way is the way to go. I'm not quite sure. I, I, I assume you mean it's, when you say getting it right, uh, Holly, you mean uh, from, from the data end of things um, that of course is an internal thing, but um, if if I if I knew your email address or anything like that, I would send you all kinds of um, information, which would back up the fact that the more you personalize, the more you segment and talk to individuals and, and create those relationships, the more money your organization is going to get. Um, I would also like to add, Holly, though, that like companies such as ours who work with, um, we pretty much work with strictly nonprofits and annual funds, um, our database managers know that. So if, if you have a concern for that, that there are going to be mistakes that maybe you haven't been able to catch, um, they um, specifically go through, like when the, uh, we're inserting, and they will make sure that there is a first name salutation, or if anything looks odd, they'll pull them. We've worked with many um, companies that this is their first time trying to personalize things, and you're right, if your data is incorrect, but you know, we, after you do it a couple times, you catch them all, we send you back the corrections as long as somebody on your end can make the corrections. But absolutely, it's going to get you a better response than your dear friend letter. OK. Um, we are, unfortunately, out of time. Um, the presenters will get, there are another four or five or so comments or questions outstanding that, unfortunately, we can't get to now. But the presenters will get a report later today or possibly early tomorrow with okay. um, all the unanswered questions. And they will be happy to get back to you. Um, there were several questions about databases and, and things like that that I actually kind of got back to some people about indicating that I will follow up with you on those issues. So um, I want to um, thank Ron and Sue for really a superb presentation. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today and for your questions and your, um, your attention. We would appreciate it if on your way out of the webinar, there's going to be a little evaluation thing that's going to pop up as soon as you leave. If you could complete that, we will appreciate that greatly. Um, and again, we hope that you know we hope we'll see you again, if not next week, sometime soon. Again, our next week's presentation is going to be why scoring membership engagement matters, and that might actually be a really nice follow-up to this session. So we hope to see you then, and again, if not, in a future session. Um, Ron and Sue, would you like to have a last word? 
I would just like to say thank you all for attending, and um, I am so excited that we had so many questions. Yeah, that's great. It was great. I was afraid that it was going to be so boring because it's just us talking to each other. So, <laughs> so thank you all very much, and please feel free to contact us at any time, even to chat, uh, just chit chat on the phone, uh, brainstorm. We're always available for that. And good luck raising more money via direct mail. Yeah, and we're we're proud of you. What you do is a wonderful thing, and uh, we're here.